Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And today's episode, I have an incredibly insightful and educational conversation with the brilliant entrepreneur, Dan Eisenhardt, CEO and founder at Form Smart Swim Goggles. Now, whether you're an athlete, an entrepreneur, or someone who likes to solve problems, or just somebody who just wants to optimize their life, this episode is for you. In this episode, Dan discusses his journey from competitive swimmer and mechanical engineer to founding Recon Instruments, the world's first smart eyewear for sports, and more recently founding Form Smart Swim Goggles. Dan describes the importance of team and playing to his strengths and mitigating his weaknesses, and we peek into the future and how technology is likely to change. Now, some housekeeping before we go on. Firstly, thank you for supporting and sharing the show. It really means the world to me. Now, if you are enjoying the show, um, you'd be doing a huge favor if you could share it on all your social platforms and get the word out. Um, and or you can support me by supporting the show's partners, Athletic Greens, Hyper Ice, and Form Smart Swim Goggles, all brilliant companies and just fantastic products. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. Do you want to move better? Do you want to reach your full potential? If yes, then you should really consider Hyper Ice Recovery Tools. Personally, I use the Hypervolt and the Vibrating Roller daily. So simple, quick, and easy to look after my body at home. Hyper Ice is currently running a few sales on both the Normatec line and the Hypervolt with Bluetooth. It's a great time for anyone to take advantage of the discount. Plus, get 10% off all Hyper Ice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show code Greg21 at checkout. Go to hyperice.com. That's hyperice.com. H Y P E R I C E.com and use code Greg21 at checkout. Are you someone who enjoys swimming in the open water? Personally, I love it far more than the pool. The thing, though, that I miss in the open water swimming is the ability to get any feedback. But now with the Form Smart Swim goggles, I have that covered. Whether I'm in the pool or open water, I can get my feedback. With Form Swim Goggles, you can see all your key metrics while you're swimming. Your distance, pace, stroke rate, and heart rate. This swim data is displayed on the goggle lens, and you can customize the display to see the metrics you want to see. The goggles track it all and are automated. You start them at the beginning of your swim, and you don't have to press any buttons in between. They automatically track everything. The goggles connect to the Form Swim app on your smartphone, and there you can review all the details of your swims. The battery life is incredible. With a one-hour charge, giving you 16 hours of swimming time. So go to formswim.com forward slash Greg. That's formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off. Or you can use code Greg15 at checkout. I'm using Athletic Greens every day. Great taste, so quick and just ready to go. I've discussed Athletic Greens with several of the guests who are using it daily as well. Miranda Carfrey, Timothy O'Donnell, Tim Don, and Sebastian Kinley. You see... Athletic Greens is more than just a multivitamin and mineral. It's a delicious blend of 75 superfoods, vitamins, minerals, probiotics, greens blend, and more to support your gut health, energy, immunity, and stress. My focus is overall health, longevity, feeling good, and feeling like I'm optimizing each day. And Athletic Greens is there for me to do just that. I've also been doubling down on Athletic Greens vitamin D, a huge portion of the population are vitamin D deficient, including myself. And right now, Athletic Greens will give you a year's supply of vitamin D for free and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Please do yourself a favor and sign up. It also makes a great gift for a family member or friend. So sign up now and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. All right, if you've listened to this show over the past few months, you would have heard me discuss Form Swim Goggles. I'm blown away by these goggles and the technology behind them. I truly believe they are the biggest thing to hit the swimming world. I was so blown away, I decided I had to bring on the founder and the CEO from Form Swim. He swam competitively for 14 years and he knows technology. Before Form, he co-founded Recon Instruments, which shipped the world's first smart eyewear for sports in 2010 and was acquired by Intel in 2015. His goal with Form is to break down the barriers between what swimming is and what it could be. He believes in doing things that nobody has done before, and that is what this show is all about. So welcome, 
And thanks for joining us on The Greg Bennett Show, Diane Eisenhout. How are you, mate? Uh, I'm great, uh, Greg, and, and thanks for the nice intro, and thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm really honored to, to be here. Well, it took us a little while. You're a busy man. I, I've been trying to get you on for about two months, it feels like, um, and working with some of your team to see if we could find a window. Um, the, the, the life of a, an entrepreneur, is it, is it that crazy at the moment? Is it, is it, you know, what's going on with you guys? <laughs> well, thanks for being a patient, first of all. Yeah, we've got a lot going. And uh, I guess, you know, coming out of the pandemic as well, we're seeing, you know, a lot of countries open up again and pools are opening up. So lots of demand and lots of new stuff that we're building. So yeah, uh, try, trying to stay, stay busy. That's brilliant. Well, today I want, I'm really keen to discuss, you know, your journey and, and your process of how you operate and, and kind of where form is at and what you believe is the future of technology, not just with form, but everything around us. I'm fascinated by that. But before we get into all of that, let's start by just getting to know you a little bit better. And if we can just rewind the clock and I guess the first thing, you know, where did your passion for both sport and technology come from? Yeah, so I grew up in a little town in Denmark called Aalborg uh, in the north of Jutland. And, uh, well, it's not that little, I guess, compared to many other towns. Uh, it's about 130,000 people. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I grew up there in a family of, of swimmers and engineers. So this, the swimming dates back to my granddad who won a river crossing back in the 1920s. And um, he had never taken any swim lessons, but he just, I guess, had a talent and, and just a passion for it and continued to swim. And then, you know, he had three sons and one of them elders was my dad and, and he, they all swam. And then me and my brother, we also started swimming and all our cousins swam. So, um, and both my brother and I are engineers and my dad's an engineer and his brothers are engineers. So it was just natural to talk swimming as sports and engineering from a very early age. That's where wow. it started. Wow, and, and and like I said in the in the intro, you, you swam competitively for about fourteen years. Did that take you around the world? Where who did you swim for, or where did you swim? Yeah, so I guess uh, through your uh, lens, this is uh, totally amateur <laughs> compared to what your achievements uh, have been in the triathlon world. Um, so I was uh, swimming at the local level and in in my own country, uh, and then uh, swimming in the U.S. as well. I did uh, spend a year at college in in the U.S. Um, but that was a great experience and I, and I swam, you know, many different sort of competitions in, in countries all over Europe and ne never did go to the Olympics or anything like that. So, um, uh, that I, my talent didn't go that far, but I, I always had a, a passion for it. I always loved swimming. I loved the longer races. So I was sort of two, four hundred and fifteen hundred, mostly four and fifteen hundred meter, which seemed long back then. Now it's a sprint if you're comparing it to an Ironman. Um, but I, I think mostly I, I was never looking at it as something that I was going to be a, like um, a, a champion at in terms of the, an, on the international stage. I, I didn't see myself having that that much challenge. But I, I did I did love swimming a lot mm. to this day. Love swimming and passionate about endurance sport. <laughs> You're the opposite to me. <laughs> swimming was the thing that I had to add on. I was like, oh, I was like you're wrong. That's not fair. I love. <laughs> open water swimming and I love in the surf. I just wasn't much of a, a chlorine pool type swimmer. I, I, for me, if you could put me out in the open water or, or catching the waves, oh, that's when I'm in heaven. So when I say I don't love swimming, that's really not true, um, but I do enjoy it. Now, you studied, I mean, you come from a family of engineering. That's, that, that's amazing. All the same kind of engineers or, or you're all branching off in different directions? I was branching off. I became a mechanical engineer and both my, well, my dad's an electrical engineer. And then when my brother, you know, did his engineering degree, it was, uh, the, the new thing was computer engineering. Uh, <laughs> so when my dad did it, the new thing was electrical engineering. So he kind of followed in my dad's footsteps and did computer engineering. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but again, I never worked as a mechanical engineer per se. I, I ended up doing other things but of course it's in the back of my mind and it's something that i'm using in my everyday life now but i was never paid to be a mechanical engineer yeah it between all of you you could probably build the space shuttle right i mean that's that's incredible <laughs> i think you need a, a few more disciplines but we could get started on the engine maybe and the control system. <laughs> i just find that extraordinary i love it um have you got kids now i have two kids yeah five and seven a boy and girl Okay, and have they got that engineering mind as well? Are they they see a problem, they've got to fix it? What are they I, like? I definitely have seen that uh, with my with my son, and I'm and I think my daughter might have it as well. But I'm not trying to 
uh, pressure them into anything. I'd love for them to become uh, like a, a, an artist or something else. It would be actually refreshing <laughs> for them to yeah. go a different path. And even my my mom actually told me back in the day. She said, "For God's sake, don't become an engineer, another engineer." And I, I was like, "No, don't worry, I won't." And I thought I was going to become a doctor. And uh, my mom worked at the hospital back then. Uh, she was doing like night shifts. She was, she was a bioanalyst in the blood bank, and so she had connections. And she got me hooked up with this doctor who was working a night shift, so I could shadow him around for a day and see if I wanted to become a doctor. And when I, at the end of that, I was like, no. I, I, I had witnessed a prostate surgery. You know, it's probably not the best type of surgery for me to witness the first time, but I just wasn't into it. It was just wasn't my passion. I never considered that as an option again. Isn't that funny, the things that we're exposed to in our youth? And then we're like, you know what, I never want to do that. I mean, my dad was a two-pack-a-day smoker growing up in the 70s and 80s, right? But And he, he gave it up to his credit um, when, when I was about 10 years old. But I remember him sitting down and going, Greg, have a cigarette with me. And uh, I had this cigarette and I swear, never for the rest of my life was I remotely interested in smoking. I know that's a little different than you becoming a doctor, but <laughs> that's my comparison. You know what? I think there might be something, something to that, that if, you know, just expose some of those bad things early enough so that you have a bad memory about it, you know, exactly. take a shot of Jim Beam at 12 and, and have a cigarette and then you'll never become a smoker or drinker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you've invented something new there, Greg. I guess there's the risk of uh, going, hang on, actually, I really enjoyed that. You're like, damn it, that backfired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh, well. now, now, so then let, let's move on because, you know, you, you've got incredible study. Actually, I want to ask one question. Would you describe yourself as an engineer or an entrepreneur these days? Entrepreneur, for sure. I, mm. I, I, I realized once I became one, I was always one. Just in, mm. the, in how my mind's wired, like I'm not a, an expert in anything. I never felt that I was the best mechanical engineer on the planet. I always felt that I was a, a jack of all trades, master of none, but I could get it deep enough to make a difference in, in, in a lot of different areas. And I kind of mm. enjoyed the multidisciplinary approach, the teamwork, uh, you know, having like tough problems to solve, but doing it in a team. And then that was, mm. that was my, my mechanical engineering degree actually at, at all, in Alborg. I stayed there and, and studied was based on that problem based learning where you were, most of the grade was about was around the projects that you were doing in these teams. And, um, and I really, so I really enjoyed that. We built a lot of fun stuff like yeah, a brewing machine and yeah, all kinds of stuff that we had to sort of make as if it was real life. And then, uh, and then the group had to work, you know, where they were strongest with each team member, uh, on the different components. And that's really a lot of that. It's really what I'm doing today as an entrepreneur. Do you, do you see yourself in those team environments taking on a leadership role or is it a bit of give and take? I, I've never been the natural leader. I think I always saw my brother as one. I mean, I'm a younger brother, so I'm I'm I, I'm, I'm not a hierarchical person. I was I was never that person. Um, I I see myself as a facilitator in many ways. Like I'm a shaper. Uh, I guess you know I really love uh, that dynamic of synergy versus compromise. You know where you're kind of everybody's seeing the same thing and you just everybody's got the same view of at the end of a meeting or a project, but this is, this is where we're going. So I like that idea of a, a vision and a, a teamwork, you know, in the team that you're, you're sort of feeding off each other's ideas and you're not thinking much about status or who has the mm -hmm. right to say something. It's all about the ideas and, mm -hmm. and then shaping the discussion and molding something valuable together is, is really what I'm passionate about doing. I think there's something to that. I've I've talked about it on the show a bit, you know, the importance of surrounding yourself with the right people, no matter what you're trying to do in your life, you know, and if you're all experts in your fields, that's one thing. But if you can all be passionate about the cause and the direction you're going and what the purpose is, it's amazing how you can make just magic happen, you know, and it's how do you facilitate that um, on an ongoing basis, I guess, is the is the key, right? It, it, it is because... I think one side is letting the creativity flow is so important because I think every person just has this almost limitless creativity and you have mm -hmm. to make sure that, that you, you harness that and release it. But at the same time, like, and you know that as an entrepreneur is that if you're not focused, you will get nowhere because you can go down a rabbit hole so easy. So how are you going to both unleash the creativity, but also bring it back in and focus on what matters? And that, mm -hmm. that's always the challenge, I think, for anybody in your personal life as well. There's so much temptation everywhere. So what, how much bandwidth do you have? How much time and resources do you have? And then try and, and be cognizant of those boundary conditions early on. 
so that you can mm. navigate uh, mm. accordingly. Well, I think a lot of it's just communicating, 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 and then there's obviously that level of trust and respect. It's like any relationship, you know, whether we're talking a marriage or your relationships at work, they they all require the same kind of massaging, you know, constant yeah constant looking in and, and making sure things are ticking along well. Um, I guess on that, you know, you you left university and you started this company called Recon Instruments. Tell us about how that evolved and was that the same team from university that you guys went on to make this happen? Yeah, there's actually an interesting chapter between those two events. So I left university. I, I did my master's also in, in Denmark there in engineering and then uh, I went straight to that. I didn't go work in between. Uh, and then, um, you know, worked as a consultant for, I think, five years, got a job at PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting Division, and I started working on implementing SAP systems, so these big ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, for big clients. And um, did that, and never was really, never really passionate about it. I loved the challenge and working, again, in teams and the freshness of going to a client and understanding, like, their complex needs and trying to solve that for them. So I did, I did really enjoy that. Um, but then realized quickly that I was never going to make that as a, sort of the end goal of my career. And, and was, I was looking for ways to make career change. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to do an MBA. And, uh, I always, so I always want to, I tried to be transferred and you're like this. Uh, when I was IBM purchased PricewaterhouseCoopers at one point and then I became an employee of IBM and I thought, okay, now I can actually maybe get a transfer to Australia because I, I was always fascinated. With with Australia, it was just this this promised land, and I, I wanted to go there. So and that didn't that didn't fall through. That, that fell through, so I couldn't I couldn't go. But uh, I thought, well, if I do an MBA, I can uh, I can maybe apply at a university in Australia, and I did that. Applied at Melbourne Business School, got in, and went there when I was I think I just turned thirty. And I went there and and uh, landed in Sydney, and the uh, first six months before, I actually had to start and bought a car there, and then drove all the way around from Sydney all the way back down to Melbourne, the long way around. Um, wow, the long met, way. The long way. It took a lot of time, and I met so many people that I'm still friends with today, but it was just a fantastic time. But, you know, that that you know that MBA was when I got exposed to entrepreneurship uh, because I, I actually soon after said yes to going on an exchange program from Melbourne to Vancouver, B.C. and Canada. Uh, and um, well, it's completely serendipitous walking into the wrong auditorium and there was an exchange program orientation and I kind of, there were a couple seats empty and I just convinced my buddy to also raise his hand and we just ended up going there to Vancouver and uh, and on that, in that program, there was an entrepreneurship course where uh, you had to pitch an idea you were passionate about and, and I thought, well, I'm passionate about swimming and technology. Uh, I've always wondered why I can't see metrics while I'm swimming. Why, why do I have to stop and kind of try and do the mental math on the full clock? And what if you could just have that information right there? This was 2006. So before the iPhone even came out, and I didn't have an answer wow. to any of those questions. And that, that, that's the, the precursor. And that then became, we already pivoted from swimming to skiing and cycling. I became recall instruments during the course. And we, you know, obviously the rest is history. We started the company. And built a number of products, uh, and then sent it sold that company to Intel in, in 2015. Well, that's incredible. You know what, what's remarkable is the amount of education you've had in all parts of the world. <laughs> you know, you, you've been in Denmark and then the US, and then back to Denmark, and then to Australia, and then over to Canada. It's. I think that. Do you think that globalization in your, in your education has helped you with you the way you look at things at all? I, I think I've always. I've never thought of myself actually as a Danish citizen, even though I am. Like I, mm. I never sort of had this, like, I think Denmark is a great place to grow up and a lot of my values are Danish, but I never felt like I was limited by my nationality and I've always loved to travel. Um, so I, I think, uh, I think traveling is just a big part of me. And I think being exposed to meeting people and to opportunity, like whether it's jumping on a plane suddenly, even though I was in Australia, I had no intentions of going anywhere else. I was like, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, Vancouver looks great and i had actually met this uh the side story behind why i actually went is that i was on a scuba diving trip in belize of all places back in 2003 or 4 i think it was i remember it was christmas day actually and there was a, another an austrian guy on the on the boat who had moved from austria to vancouver and he was just raving about vancouver how beautiful it is he was skiing and 
and you know I was swimming in the ocean I thought that's pretty cool and then I sort of packed it in the back of my mind maybe one day I'll go and then when I saw that that was the cue when I saw that orientation for exchange programs in Vancouver popped up popped up I was like wow now I have to go and then you know you just you just kind of go with it and I think you if you just stay at home and and don't do anything you kind of don't let yourself be exposed to stuff like this I think if you'll take on a different path in life so this was mm. good for me that Vancouver, we lived in Victoria, Canada from 2000 to 2005. So just on the island of oh, Vancouver. It's beautiful over there. My goodness, it's a magnificent part of the world. And, and not only is it beautiful, I, I found the people there to be some of just the most wonderful, nicest people I've ever met in the, on the planet. Um, I can understand why, you, why you're there. I think it's uh, Canada itself is an incredible country, but I think it's just such a beautiful part of the world. Yeah, no, it is. And you, you, you'll recognize that from, from Australia as well, because I, I always say that Australians are the most friendly people I've ever met and it's beautiful there as well. So, yeah, between mm. Melbourne and Vancouver, those are the two cities that I was going to settle down in. You know, it could have been either or, and, uh, and it just turned out to be Vancouver. That's great. Now, tell us a bit more about these recon instruments, because I'm fascinated. You pivoted from swimming, which was the focus, to then skiing and, and running and cycling. Why was that? So it was really out of necessity. We started in skiing, and that was that was sort of the, the DNA, the core of, of recon instruments. Um, so this was, let's say, the, the school project was in 2006, and halfway through that term, we pivoted from swimming goggles to ski goggles. We knew Olympics was coming up, I guess, four years later, just under four years later, uh, in Vancouver, and so that was already on our mind. And we were looking for a different application, but where you were sort of solving the same problem of access to information as a hands-free. And we looked at all the different things, and then we're like, "Well, skiing, you're already paying, you know, two hundred bucks for a pair of goggles. You're paying a hundred bucks for a lift ticket, so the money's there, and there's a bit of bulk there you can hide stuff in." And that was the main issue, why reason why we didn't uh, go ahead with the swimming goggles. It was just too too hard to pull off. So yeah, so we settled on that, and and um, and 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 we managed to do a business model where we could partner with the world's biggest brands because they all wanted this. And, and we defined a, a geometry, a standard that we patented that meant that we could sort of, quote unquote, force those big brands to adopt it because there's nobody else. And then we could co-brand with them. So we always said we were the Intel inside of the action sports industry. And then Intel ended up buying us, which is all funny <laughs> uh, how, how that happens. But so, so that, that was out of necessity from a technology perspective. And we saw that that was probably skiing was the best use uh, was the best use case we thought as well, um, all things considered. So that's, that's what we went ahead. And then eventually we realized that it was too seasonal and it was it's just too difficult to keep mind share of customers when you're only in their minds maybe a week a year. You're lucky. And then the rest of the year, they don't care about you. And we only had revenues, you know, sort of November, December, January. And then everything goes on sale for a couple of months. So we needed to find a hedge against that. And that's when we came up with the sunglasses for cycling and running. Uh, and we developed those sunglasses ourselves. We didn't go through partners. That was too complex. Uh, and that was really the precursor to form in the sense that uh, that's when we learned how to build eyewear. We weren't just the technology inside somebody else's eyewear. We became completely vertically integrated. And we had the whole stack in-house. Uh, and that was both scary but also empowering because we had that control. I remember you guys advertising, um, and we did you sponsor Chris McCormack? Or I we can't remember who we did. Who you, so this was not until Intel purchased us, and then I ended up. I became the the general manager of the global head worn division, and under that there was a bunch of projects already going, and one of them was the rate of pace with Oakley, and and uh, and and he was. I think we sponsored him for the launch of that product. Gotcha. I remember that. I remember now. When it came to cycling, um, did you have any issues with people being able to see clearly? I mean, that was the big thing. It was like, yeah, you know, when, when we're wearing this, I don't want to be seeing numbers when I need to be seeing cars or something. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I was, you know, I was always worried and aware of that, and we did our best to really mitigate risk as much mm. as we could. Of course, in the software and in all kinds of disclaimers, but you know, it was the first product of its kind, and we were. You know, we we were called sort of the sporty cousin of glass. Uh, it's funny because we we were we launched the world's first consumer head to display with the with the ski goggles, and then we just ended up 
we weren't able to put it into a glass sunglass until later on. But I, I knew that it was an early generation of, of it and, it, and it would take some years to get small enough to hit mainstream. So I, I saw it as a lead use case cycling, and then the platform underneath, which was Android. So we could we had a whole SDK, like a, an ecosystem of developers that developed apps for us. Like we even had mm-hmm. a GoPro app, for example, so you could actually stream GoPro live video feed into the goggles and the glasses. Um, wow. And um, we ended up putting a camera as well on the glasses. But so, so we were more looking at the platform approach and letting the market dictate, okay, which application is going to actually be the killer app. And, and that was across sport and enterprise. And we ended up having a lot of really interesting apps. Like one of the interesting ones was a paintball application. Actually, a paintball mask company came to us and they said, hey, we actually make paintball, like the guns and the masks. And we were thinking maybe we can integrate that and get live feed from the gun. And we can even put a camera on the gun. You can shoot around corners and we can see how many shots have been fired. And, and then we can do body tracking, red, blue team. We're like on it. And, uh, and we, you know, and we built that application and, um, that was just for after Intel purchased us. And we, uh, we ended up, uh, showing, showcasing that at CES in 2016 in January and won, uh, one of the innovation awards there. So that was, um, that was an interesting application, but there was, there was a ton of different applications there that we were trying out. Uh, but we didn't really have the killer app, I would say, to your point. It wasn't mature enough, but we could say this is a no brainer. Like, uh, there was still some trade offs. It still blows me away what you guys are capable of. I just, and I love hearing your passion the way you talk about it. It's just incredible. There's an idea, and you know what the next steps are. When, when you, what was that like when Intel bought you guys? What was that process like? And did you feel like you were kind of, giving up your firstborn or, and when you became a general manager, you know, what was that like? Um, suddenly yeah. did you have a boss? You know, that's kind of a different world for an entrepreneur to go into. Yeah. I think as an entrepreneur, you're always used to having, you know, bosses that are your shareholders and your customers mm. and your board and everything. So there's, there's no such thing as a bossless existence, right? So you're always working to please somebody because you want to sell what you do, what you, what you're producing. But uh, I didn't have so much a problem with that. I think first, your first question there. I think the timing was perfect because we had reached a stage where we would need so much money to try and go for the next step uh, and get this to become the new user interface at a time when we still had to put in probably three years of R and D. You know, whatever mm-hmm. use case we were going to end up winning, whether it was in the enterprise or in sports. And I saw cycling. Yeah, it wasn't going to take off because I thought I, I kind of knew that the value that you were deriving from a a head-to display was still incremental because you have a a handlebar. So it's not too hands-free and you have a computer that's good enough. So Mm -hmm. so I thought, "Mm, that's not really killer. up there running. The watch is good enough. And the trade-off of having a pair of sunglasses that you have to wear that are kind of bouncing on your nose and a little bit heavier is too big. Um, Mm -hmm. So I went through all these deliberations and and I thought, you know what? The dilution of having to bring in that much money and the loss of control, you know, it's too much risk. And I had a small family and then I had, you know, my, my firstborn, I uh, was born in, in December 13, you know, it was two and, and we had another one coming and I thought, okay, um, like now it's probably a good time. So it was the right time to sell and I didn't have any issues with it. And I thought it landed in a good place. Intel is a fantastic company and, and I really, really uh, respect Intel and what they're capable of just the smartest people. Like if, if you're in a room and, and, and half, at least half of them don't have a PhD in chemistry or something, then it's, <laughs> then, then it's an unusual meeting. So it's, it's just a very, just a lot of smart people there. So that was, that was really cool. And I think, I think to your second part there about suddenly now working in a fortune 50 company, right? I went from mm-hmm. being in an organization where let's say we were 65 people when we got, when we sold to sort of in my P and L, there was like 1300 people all over the world. And, uh, and suddenly now I went from being in the engine room as a product guy to being an administrator mm. and a budget guy, which I'm not. That, that I thought was the hardest thing because I had to then stand up in front of my team while I was usually in control of decisions and say, oh, we got budget. We're going to do this, this, and this. And we went from two projects to 30 projects, right? And we did, and there was all these people. And then next budget cycle, like less than a year later, it all got shut down. Oh, we're not doing this now. We're doing that. So you have to, and whereas I know that R&D cycle for, uh, just, they require like a, a firm decision, lots of research, but then a firm decision and you stick to it. 
mm. because it takes two, three years, right? And then the, the toll back and forth, that, that, that I thought was the hardest. And, and, and so when you left Intel and you decided, did you start to you decide to start Form Swim Goggles right away? And, and was there any pushback from Intel on that or were they happy to let you go and, and you know, go yeah. about what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, Intel was uh, a really good buyer in the sense that they're entrepreneurial. At least they they are um, they give a lot of freedom to their employees in terms of also having outside interests as long as you disclose them. Uh, so I disclosed them. Uh, I mean, upfront, and I said, "Listen, I am passionate about swimming and swim tech. We never did that uh, within recon. We tried a couple of times, but it just we just didn't have bandwidth." I said, "I I feel like I own that." And uh, and luck, lo and behold, they, they they countersigned that, and I actually ended up owning, <laughs> carving out the whole swim tech space. Wow! So that was that was I was free to go and do whatever I wanted, and, and so I actually started up the project almost the, I think the week after we sold the company. I called some of my former employees that had actually one of them, one of my co-founders shared forum. Adam is from Brisbane, Australia, and he had moved back for family reasons. Uh, mm. so he was not part of recon anymore. So I, I was free to kind of approach him. And I said, uh, you know, Adam, do you want to, do you want to start this up? And he's like, sure. And he basically, <laughs> you know, said, okay. And ended up moving his whole family back up here. And he's still here. But, um, uh, and, uh, and another person who was in charge of optics at, at recon, but had, had left before Intel purchased us. I, I also got him back and we, we started to, um, have weekly uh, meetings about this project and we did a little proof of concept. So yeah, I started basically the week after. A quick mini break. I really want to encourage you to do something special for yourself and sign up for Athletic Greens and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. If you want to see all your key metrics like your pace, distance, stroke rate, and heart rate while you're swimming, you need the Form Smart Swim goggles. Go to formswim.com forward slash Greg. That's formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off. Or you can use code Greg15 at checkout. Take advantage of the great sale going on now at Hyperice. Plus get 10% off all Hyperice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show discount code Greg21 at checkout. Go to hyperice.com and use code Greg21. I, I love the fact that you've kept uh, you've kept this same kind of team, this this core, you know, that you've been able to travel with for the last well, however many years. You know, there's something to that. I think where you can all be on the journey together. Yeah, and that that's really. I think without that experience at Recon, I mean, there's really not many people that have on their resume that they've built, you know, five generations of consumer heads of displays for sports. There's nobody. And so those people I have in, in each of the positions here still today, most of them are from those days. And um, mm -hmm. you end up getting more and more of as we, as Intel started closing down divisions, we just, I just kept hiring. At one point we were 50% ex Intel Recon and 50%. And they were actually happy because they felt bad that they had to close down because they change obviously strategy all the time. And, and, and I was like in a position where, yeah, I'll, I'll take him. <laughs> you know, I was like waiting for their non-compete to, but yeah, I'll take him. So I, you know, it was, it was a really good, and, and, and still, I, I think we were very, I was very specific about this not being a recon 2.0. Like I said, this yeah. is a new team, new culture, leave the recon, you know, sticker, whatever it is at the door. And let's not use that word ever. I ended up slipping up a few times and say, oh, I'd recon, we did such and such, but I don't do that anymore now. Yeah, uh, it's all like because you can't have an A and a B team, and it's no. and so so now we're formed and we have a completely different culture and and I, I think a way better culture and, and a better brand and better everything. So it's a step up from Recon. So let's get to the real core of it. I mean, why do we need a heads up display for for the swim goggles? What was your? I mean, was that something that when you were a kid swimming, you going, I wish I didn't have to look up at the clock or. I'm swimming out around a lake. I wish I knew how far I was going. I mean, what yeah. is the real core reason for, for having this? I, I think my frustration comes from the fact that nobody that I had known had expressed the pain that's associated with not knowing. 
Mm. And, and that, that frustrated me whenever you say, where else do you like, oh, I wish we could do this better. I wish we could do that. And then you have something here where there's just this acceptance of a gigantic void in technology adoption in a sport that's one of the biggest sports in the world. Like you've got 240 million active pool swimmers in the world, 30 million in the U.S. alone, 10 of the 30 swim more than once a week. So this is it's a life skill. This is a massive sport. And still, mm. people think swimming is a niche sport. And I was like, you got to go look at Statista or something and just you know, read up on swimming. So yeah. why, why, is, why is swimming stuck in, in the Stone Age? And, it's so and true. I'm, it is so true, right? I mean, a new kickboard comes out and people are like, oh, man, this is high-tech kickboard or high-tech paddle. It has an extra little piece of plastic. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> just like invented 100 years ago. How can we bring technology to swimming to solve real problems? Not gadgets, not, oh, you know, I can speak to you and then you talk back to me and all. No, I, I don't care about that. I care about just getting back to, getting up to a similar level that you have in the play cycling and running. You know, mm-hmm. how far have you gone? What's your split? You know, maybe what's your heart rate? And, and you know, maybe some a few more metrics, but that's it. Like, how do you get that in a way that is effortless, that does not impede with your enjoyment of being in the pool, that does not come with huge you know drawbacks in terms of the size of the goggles so that they are unique and all that stuff how, how could we do that and I, I it was very apparent to me that having a wristwatch on in the in the in the pool you know it's like you know wearing it around your ankles running no, right you have yeah. to, you'd have to stuff and do weird things to look at it and it does not make sense so yet I knew that the only solution would be in the goggles and and so that that, that was what I thought it must be possible. And after having the experience at Recon where we were building what's called an opaque display, like a micro display, think about a monitor that you glance at and that you can't see through. But that was kind of what we built inside the ski goggles and also on the outside of the, of the cycling classes. I, I didn't want that. I actually, I wanted to have something that was truly immersive and see-through that you could just look through and then see the metrics in front of you. It blows me away. The pair that I have, and, and I'll never forget jumping in the pool earlier this year, or was it late last year, whenever it was, and I was with Laura, and I said, here we go, I'm going to try this on. And I said, I hope I, you know, these numbers aren't so distracting. But what blows me away, and you can probably explain why it is this way, is I swim, and I'm going swimming along, and I have to remember to look at the numbers. Like you, your eye doesn't look at the numbers. You have to go... What, what are the numbers I'm looking at? You have to consciously say that to yourself. And, and that's what was incredible about me. That was probably the biggest takeaway I had from them was, well, firstly, they just feel like normal goggles. But secondly, yeah, there was this, the numbers weren't in my way. I had to actually make the effort to consciously look at them. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's funny how you describe it. And I now look back to the first time I jumped in the pool with the first pair of prototypes and how I felt having swum my whole life. It was just, it, it was, it, it sounds like a cliche, but it was kind of an out of body experience because I've been so used to just, I have earplugs in too, so I'm completely isolated in the pools looking at that black line in the bottom and I've, you know, swimming a lot. And, uh, and suddenly I just had this, I'm not going to call it entertainment because that's not what it is, but it just made that hour go by like it was 10 minutes and I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. I really felt like I had a companion that I could trust and that I would just, you know, be able to get that information, like the value that you are, um, capturing every moment that you read something that you would not have been able to read. It's not like it's incrementally better. It is night and day. Like before, mm-hmm. you wouldn't stop in the middle of the pool and try and work out the math on the clock or look at your, like you just wouldn't get it. And suddenly now you get it. And now I remember when I, when I connected the first time I connected the heart rate sensor, I've been, I'm 46, I've been swimming my whole life. I've never seen my heart rate. <laughs> never seen my heart rate in real time underwater. And then suddenly, boop, it just popped up there and it was just, I'm just like, Oh man, that is just, that's wild. And, yeah. and those experiences, every time we launch a new feature, I have those same experiences every time. I'm just like, it just blows me away. And, and, uh, and it's, that's really why I get up in the morning because it's just like, that's fun to be part of. Well, you've been now form, when did you guys launch? Was it mid 2019? You've been going now about 18, 20 months? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was in, uh, yeah, August 2019. We launched and we had a good run. And then pandemic hit, and then you know we, we like just had to survive yeah. through that, but still had a good year. So yeah, um, it hasn't been too long. 
Yeah. The, the, the numbers that you mentioned earlier, I was jotting them down, 240 million swimmers worldwide, 30 million in the US alone. Yeah. And of those swimmers, you said one third of those swim at least once a week. That is not a niche market. I mean, that's uh, – has that and on the business side of what you're doing, has that been? Have you been able to see that yet, or is it sort of slowly growing? Have you got the sort of the early adopters at the moment, and how, how's that going? I think we, yeah, I think we still, we're still early adopters because, and we'll, well, I guess early adopters not so much from a mindset. It's not gadget people that aren't swimming. Like we have people that are passionate about swimming that are buying mm-hmm. these, these products. They're not just lying on a desk somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what we saw through the pandemic is you have 90% of pools closing or whatever, you know, at different times, albeit in different countries. And you and we still grew. <laughs> so, 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 so we're obviously a, a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the big market. So even if the market shrinks by 90%, there's still a ton of swimmers that we can attract and that will buy our goggles. So that just showed you the opportunity. Like our biggest challenge is awareness that, that, awareness. that people understand is there. Competitive. There's no competitors either, right? I mean, this is not in this category. When you look at see-through optics, there's other the substitutes, alternatives that aren't see-through and aren't and and and. But n- there's nothing. I think I think um, Finis came out with something the other day. But that that I think and I think you will see companies come out with um, alternatives that try to kind of get halfway there in terms of uh, being able to give you metrics more easily. And I welcome that. I think. Mm. I think a market, a category is not a category until you have a couple of companies. Um, but mm. but for us, we we have the IP on the uh, on the see through optics. We design that in house, and and it's you know a very tricky thing to do underwater because of the different refraction index between the water and the air. So you have to come up with some stuff there to make that work. And um, so we we do think we do feel that this is not a land grab, sort of a race to try and and get big as quickly as possible to avoid sort of the competitive impact, which obviously moving fast, but we do have the luxury of having uh, that those barriers to entry. Mm, you make a good point there about the marketplace and you think of, you know, the Garmin GPS versus, well, with the Polar, with the, you know, the different brands that are out there that we use for running and biking and all the different measurements. And they do, it creates a, a whole marketplace um, that in, builds the, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, I think totally. that's... Uh, yeah, a great way to look at it. Um, yeah, how, how have you found and the the data that comes from the goggles and how that can be used to improve performance? Um, do you guys have that kind of education on the on your sites as well? Like, how if people are using these goggles and and how they can actually use heart rate, stroke rate, um, distance, and all these things to become a better swimmer? Yeah, we're we're really digging into that uh, a lot of. So the content pieces that we release, you know, on our blog and in other places revolve around not so much about, oh, you can track yourself. That's kind of now established, but it's more, okay, so what can you do with this data to make you better or enjoy mm-hmm. your swim more? Heart rate is an important piece. Uh, we use distance per stroke and stroke rate, you know, looking at how can you make technical gains at the same heart rate, you know, and that's something Lionel Sanders, who's one of our uh, professional triathletes, who I'm sure you know of, is mm-hmm. very keen on making the technical gains. And then, you know, he's, he always says he would not leave home without our goggles because uh, it's just not the same uh, to swim with an old pair of goggles. But yeah, that piece of like, what can the data do for you? You have access to it. And, and we have made it so that you can see all the different sets and go in and look at the structure of your workout. Versus, you know, like if you look at watches and you go to a swim worker, it's just like lap one to through 60. And you have no idea of whereabouts in that one through 60, or did you do your three by 400, you know, uh, freestyle at race pace or something. So it's, we make it super easy um, to go and identify where in your, in your workout, um, you know, are, are you and what have you done? And then you can drill into the, each, each uh, link and look at all these different metrics. Now, I'm going to ask you um, what's next because I was thinking, <laughs> so you're going to have to bring me on your team because I've got all these ideas. Um, I was thinking when your hand goes into the water, you know, the swimming is so technique, you know, driven. And how could we use something to show that your hand's missing water or it's grabbing water and have that? Then let you you see it on your screen. Hey, you know, Greg, you your right hand slipping as you as you come in. Bring your hand over. Is that the future? I mean, where do you go 
now with the, I don't know, with the tech? And, and <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. I think I, I do believe that the future is not just in tracking and showing information in real time. That's not why we built the company. You know, that was a necessary you know, means uh, to an end. Uh, you, know, you need to be able to track to be able to do anything. I do believe that, and this is one of the reasons why we've created this immersive interface uh, with the see-through optics, is that it'll allow us to do more than just show numbers, right? So we can do all kinds of things with this display, and, and we're working through customer feedback and finding out what is it actually what's going to be next. Um, so when you when you become a form customer, you don't just become a user of another activity tracker. You actually join a club, mm. and, and it's and the product is just it can do so much more than what it's doing right now. So that's 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 one thing. The the way that we calculate our metrics in the pool, uh, and the way we've automated everything, you'll notice you don't have to stop stop anything. It just does it automatically. It's through machine learning, and uh, and that's what's taking a long time. It's a big part of our IP is is that getting to that level of accuracy with machine learning, uh, independent of skill level. So whether you're a beginner or a Olympian, it doesn't matter. We're just as accurate. So um, so. We have those sensors and that compute power. And so there's many things that you can do with that. And I, I do believe that there is a future where uh, we can we can offer something more than just tracking it, that we can give you recommendations to how you could actually improve. And I think that would be an interesting problem to solve. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe I'll take that back to the team. <laughs> 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 I, I, look, I, might, I have no idea on how you, you, you know any of this works. I'm just an athlete, but I, I do. Um, my mind wanders, you know, on this kind of thing. And you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, the companion, um, and that word stuck out to me because it was this, you know, swimming can be quite lonely, yeah. um, and you felt like you had a companion by, you know, the data coming up on the screen and, and these kinds of bits and pieces. I was also wondering, you know, if there's a potential where you could have something where your coach is talking to you through your goggles that it, a coach could actually be seeing it on the phone or whatever they're using to see your stroke or they've got a pair of glasses on and they're able to visualize what you're seeing in your goggles and they can be talking to you. Have you thought about that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no. And we, you know, the funny thing is, you know, coming back to it, to, to focus, right, is that you can kind of do anything with technology, right? And it's just yeah. what is the trade off? It's either price or bulk or something else. Mm. And who are your customers, right? So if you put too much, too many features in there, yeah, you may solve that for 1%, so like 1% of the care. Right. And I mentioned they don't care, they yeah. have to live. They great. <laughs> so, We're bankrupt, but yeah, well, here you go. <laughs> so it's like, I, I, I actually have to always check sort of my passion at the door for something that's yeah. on the competitive side of things, because I would love to do a lot of things, but then you kind of start looking at, well, you know, what does it take away? How does it take away from our core experience? And what about, you know, the bulk of our customers? What do they care about? So mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that um, there's, there's a lot of really interesting applications that are mm -hmm. possible uh, with, with what we have, maybe not today, but, but in the near future. And, it, and we're going to have to decide, okay, what are we integrate and build in? And what, what do we maybe leave to other brands or leave to an accessory play where we just, yeah, integrate like we already have partners like we're connecting with you know we started with polar for the hot rate so now you don't we don't have to build that in and make it more bulky you just connect it and then we have the bluetooth mm -hmm. connectivity we partner with garmin for watches so that you can get the gps from the watch and then you can swim open water uh, and, and with apple as well if you're not a traffic you just have an apple watch well you know it's a free app and you can go and use use them with our goggles and now now you're, you're not alone anymore in the open water either which I think is an even bigger, I don't know if you tried that, but when you're in the open water, you're used to being completely alone, except in Australia, you'll probably have a few great whites there. But apart from that, you're, you're, you're kind of uh, you know alone, and a lot of people get a bit anxious when they're in the open mm -hmm. water, especially if they're beginner traffic. And what we hear from a lot of customers is that suddenly they actually feel more grounded and they have less anxiousness because they have this display that they're used to seeing in the pool, and now they're seeing it in open water. It gives them structure. Mm. Uh, when I had uh, Dr. Hannah Wells on the show, who I believe is a sponsored form swim athlete as well, and uh, I was asking her about the goggles, and she said, "Greg, just it's amazing in the open water. Just it's been just so fantastic." And I thought about all the lake swimming we did in Victoria, Canada, which we meant, you know, Elk Lake, Thetis Lake, more than anything. And we were always like, "Oh, it's around the island is 800 meters, or the Far Islands 1500 meters." And 
none of us had any idea. Um, and then I always did a lot of fart leg type training. I was never one that uh, most of my swimming, I did open water when I was racing professionally. I just loved fart leg, whether it be swing, biking or running. I never liked to be told exactly an amount of time. I just like to play with speed. And, and now I can actually get an idea of, oh, I was going for 150 meters on this effort. You know, I was going and, and this was my stroke rate and this was my heart rate during that time. I can actually come back and look at the results on, on the iPhone or whatever and, and, and see it. Um, that, that's the extraordinary part is that ability to go open water where you've never had any idea what you're doing. And now you can come back and go look at it. I mean, you can look at it while you're doing it is my point, but then you can come back and analyze it when, when you come back. Yeah. It really is fantastic. Um, I, I want to move on to a little bit. When I was preparing for this, I watched a video of a presentation you did and it was Smart Eyewear 2031. Now, this was back in 2016. I was wondering if you could share for our listeners the story that you talked about with the, the wristwatch in 1916 and then – and then give your thoughts on where you see, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, the world going. Because I, I just found that all really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, a lot has happened even since, since that, that, that talk. And yeah, I was still employed by Intel. And, um, and I had a different mandate just to give the backstory that my mandate was, of course, more, more mainstream. Like how could we build the next compute platform that takes over from the smartphone versus building, you know, purpose-built AR applications for, you know, cycling or running, you know. So, so there's a different set of constraints that you have to be way smaller and, and the technology had to be see-through. And we had some crazy development that uh, it within Intel, like stuff that I had never seen before. Uh, so the context of this was more like, okay, what is the mainstream application, mainstream application for augmented reality? And, um, and then what I did was I kind of referenced a, a TED Talk that I had done I think a year earlier, the TEDx talk in Vancouver, which was um, where I talked about this notion of the watch and how people, you know, back in the day, you know, telling time, you know, time is still one of the most sought after pieces of information to this day. Back in the day, it was location dependent, right? So you had to basically be at the town square <laughs> to see the time. And then, uh, then after a few hundred years, the pocket watch emerged. And you, all you have to do is take it out of the pocket and then open the lid and there was, there was time. You consumed the time. So you were suddenly mobile. You know, you could actually take time with you. And that changed the world in many ways. And then, but getting from the pocket to the wrist was something that took, a, it took hundreds of years because it was perceived, it was really the first wearable is the wristwatch. And, and this notion of, of the fashion aspect being a blocker more than the technology being a blocker to adoption. I think I've always been intrigued by, and, and we can talk about when you move from the wrist to the face, that is a gigantic leap, you know, and that's why it's taking so long, uh, you know, and, and it really took the, the, the soldiers in the first world war to come home and show everybody their wristwatches because they had used them in the entrenched warfare. It's hard to hold a gun and at the same time, take a pocket watch out because they have to time the attack. They have to know exactly when to go. And so they could mm. instead just have the wristwatch. So they made their own little wristwatch. There. And, then that, and then that was suddenly cool because the, these heroes in the First World War had used it. So now it, was, now it just became adopted and it was masculine to have a wristwatch. Um, and and, and an anecdote is that actually women had already adopted that as jewelry you know, decades before that. And, and that's, why, that's why men thought it was kind of sissy to, uh, to wear a wristwatch. It was viewed as a piece of jewelry that women would wear, but then it became masculine. So, 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 so that's kind of just talking about how, well, how big a role adoption plays, you know, even though technology is there. For, um, for augmented reality, it's a bit of both, you know, and it's a race between both. So the technology is mature enough to have something that is a pair of, uh, a, of eyewear that looks exactly like a normal pair of glasses. That, that is still not the case. It's getting there, but it's still not the case. Battery life aside. But even if it were the case, you know, let's say, you know, people have individual tastes and needs and they, they want to be able to get the glasses. And they, may, they may not be wearing glasses at all. So why should they suddenly start to wear glasses? Um, and, and then you could say, well, the benefit of wearing the glasses, if, let's say if you're not wearing glasses or if you don't like the glasses as much as, if, you know, you could just choose freely. The benefit has to outweigh the, uh, the cost by at least a 10x. Right? It has to be like, wow, I'm getting all of this just for that. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so there's that matrix, you know, 
uh, cost benefit matrix there that's happening right now. So what I was trying to say, and that was maybe not as popular inside Intel at the time, because we had ambitions to launch like the world, like the, the, the next UI within a few years. And what I was trying to say with that was that I didn't believe that was possible. And I and I said that this this is uh, that's why I picked 2031, and I said it's going to happen for sure, but it's not going to be now or tomorrow. It's going to be there's going to be multiple vertical applications. Swimming is one. There's going to be enterprises, tons of vertical applications that are specific, specific problems. Before that, before you have what's called the horizontal, which is the platform. Um, but 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 I think um, the most I think what I what I learned most from actually researching for that talk was this notion of a world where we do have AR, where we all are wearing glasses with augmented reality and computer vision and overlaying of all kinds of personalized information annotated in front of you. Um, well, how would that change the world? And 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 this comes back to seeing. I think there's going to be a shift. We're already starting to see bubbles now with the internet where if you have certain beliefs, well, they get reinforced by your search history and so forth. But in mm -hmm. the future, when you have uh, wearing uh, eyewear, every single person is a bubble because you're seeing, you may sit and watch the same movie as somebody else, but you're seeing two different things. You may have chosen a filter that gives you a link uh, to, a, to the clothes, to buy the clothes that the actors are wearing. And the other person may look at the, you know, the resume uh, annotating mm. top of your vision of each person and the third person maybe you see something else. And when you're outside, so so all these filters, this individualized experience, I think it's going to create some challenges in terms of how we interact with the world that's now completely different depending on who you are. Does Do you think there's a possibility of disconnection? I mean, it's one of the things we've, we're facing now with people on their iPhones. Um, you know, there's this... <laughs> Are we more social or are we less social? You know, because quite often we're we're socializing while we're using a Instagram app or whatever. We're chatting with our friends on a phone, and we're almost bringing the phone up to the eyes. So maybe now we're kind of looking at somebody and we feel like we're interacting, but we're not really. Is I mean, and yeah. I guess on that, what responsibility do the guys like yourself, you know, the, these tech builders have with these kind of products to make sure that they're they're for good use and not. Yeah, tearing society apart. I guess. No, you're asking the right question. I think that was a dilemma that was going on inside my head because I was in charge mm -hmm. of all of these projects, and I have always seen AR as a tool. I'm more somebody who likes a specific problem and then a solution to a problem. And I'm not a social media person myself, and I, I, I but I like to use technology to solve problems. So I'm probably more in the purpose-built camp. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I also kind of know if you're looking at history, you know, bringing information closer to your attention is, is one of the, the main goals of humanity. Like you know, the information and being able to do something more efficiently is just is so deeply encoded in our DNA. And if the technology is there, I think it's going to be used. So I, I definitely think there's a responsibility to try and, and tame that and think about the ethics and the regulations beforehand. I mean, you can think about, I, I am a big opponent of the, of, the mobile phone as something you just kind of have to check every second, even though all of us have had that situation where you're just like, okay, I've got nothing else to do. So you sit and look at your phone, but you probably would have something else to do if you didn't have the phone. You may have to sit and think about like what's, you know, what you're going to do tomorrow or something like that, you know? So I, I do fear a world where, you know, what we're seeing now is nothing. The AR could amplify all the bad habits. That is a big fear of mine. And then you can talk about advertising and, you know, all the big ecosystem players, there's going to be the same Apple, Google, and so forth. And they're going to want your eyeballs. And now they have them, you know, mm -hmm. literally. And now they can subsidize everything and make it free for you. And, and now you give up your, really, your, your freedom because mm -hmm. now you're being served up all this stuff. And so, oh, and it's complicated, but I'm also a brand. I like to sell products. And if I didn't have Instagram, Facebook to get customers to my site, I wouldn't sell products. So it's very complicated. This is, isn't it? I, I even find that with my this show and things, you know, I've never been most of my athletic career was before the iPhone and social media and, and that kind of thing. And and so I remember even having sponsors going, you know, Greg, how many social media followers do you have and how often are you posting? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to talk about myself unless somebody asks. Yeah. You know, that was the generation I came from. So this whole self promotional thing has never felt natural or comfortable. And you know. I do this with, I try to promote the, the show and, and, and what we're doing and, and because I want people to hear about it and I think it'd be great. So you, you as much, it's a love-hate, isn't it, these, these, uh, these platforms that you have? No, it is, um, it is totally. That's why it's so complicated. 
Yeah. It is complicated. It is complicated. Let, let, let's talk about you just quickly um, and the way you operate on a daily basis. Are you a routine type person being an engineer? I assume that are you a routine type of guy or are you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, and, and, and the funny thing is that, again, I don't identify myself as an engineer. It's just one thing I've done and I, I work with engineers, I'm but I, I'm as, like, as an entrepreneur, creative entrepreneur, <laughs> wired, I think I'm just wired in a weird way where I, I'm very curious about almost everything. And, yeah. uh, and I just try to, I don't feel like I'm an expert in anything, but I, I really do love, I just, I just, I just do love uh, to learn new things, but mm. I would say I, I have a routine, but I also have a routine that allows me still to be serendipitous about my time. Like, so I can go and, because that's kind of what's brought me here. So I try not to run too tight a ship where there's no room for anything else. Like I can cancel anything at any time and do something else is, is what I think comes down to being, you have obligations, obviously, and family is number one. And, and then you've got, you know, work, which I which is also my passion and my hobby and what I find fun is, is super important. Uh, but there's also other things in life that make you in, into a person. And I think, you know, understanding what to what to say no to, so that you can say right a yes to the right things. You know, it's really what it is, so that you can kind of make sure that there's bandwidth and don't stress out too much. Um, that's kind of that, that that's kind of my mo. And then my my routine is that I'll I do a workout every morning, uh, and that's just I love doing it. I don't even have to force myself to do it. It's just something. And my wife does the same thing. We're both both do so we get up early. Do the workout and um and I, I love you know, I did that Ironman in uh, in Hawaii in 2019 and I I really really love the training aspect of triathlon so I do love the variety of swimming and cycling and running and so that's what I I do in a week I will usually get uh, you know workouts in so that I can go across those three disciplines and then you know who knows when my next event will be but um that's my morning and then I go you know to work uh, and. Uh, and either in, during the pandemic, of course, there's been a lot of remote work. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I really look forward to being face to face. But uh, then it's typically a, a very rewarding day of just a ton of different meetings with different teams because we're so multidisciplinary. We go across, you know, software, hardware, and optics, and sales, marketing, and product. And so we have everything in house. So it's like yeah, well. every day is so different depending on just, you know what's pressing that day or. You know, what design review, you know, we have a decision to make between our two things and the, the, the really important things for the product. And I, I just love that challenge of just having something new all the time. You just, you just don't know what the, what today's going to bring or what tomorrow's going to bring. So you, you, you describe yourself as you're not an engineer, but what you are, you are a problem solver. You love to see all the, you're creative in the sense that you're looking for all different little problems everywhere. And then you're trying to solve them. So when I call you an engineer, I don't even mean to call you a mechanical engineer. I just mean the may, the way your mind works and operates. I, I see it is you see problems and you have to solve them. Yeah, and I think that's that's. Uh, that's correct. I want to I, I want to finish the show because I know I've taken a lot of your time and and you've, <laughs> there's a lot more you could be doing than than talking to me. But I guess let's just end with a few questions um, and maybe some fun ones at the end. But first off. What advice can you give to sort of a new entrepreneur or somebody that's got a new startup company? You've been through the process now a couple of times. Is there anything that you can advice that you can give to a new entrepreneur or startup company? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest piece of advice is that just make absolutely sure that you're extremely passionate about this idea before you you go down the path. A lot of people want to be entrepreneurs and and maybe they feel that they are in an industry that will allow them to get a head start in that industry, but they may not be passionate about it. It's not something that they really enjoy doing. And then there's no way that you're going to make it if you're not passionate about it because it's so hard. And it can't, like, it's not about the destination. It's, it's, it is the journey. It's a cliche, but it's true. And, a, and, a, and an entrepreneurial journey is, you know, seven to 10 years at minimum. And it's hard work and you don't get financially rewarded. Uh, until the end, if you're lucky, many don't, and you're still foregoing a lot of certainty and uncertainty. So you better love the process, right? And mm-hmm. and I think that's uh, that's it. And then even when you have the passion, don't let that passion blind you, and think that passion justifies making anything because you're passionate about it. 
<laughs> that then you're also then you're going to be unhappy. So you should make sure that you do your homework on customers and what they want and be agile in terms of tweaking that minimal viable product into something that the customers want. And that that requires a level of honesty, introspection, and sort of putting like almost like an out of body experience where you may want something desperately, but you have to let it go if it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that you have to know yourself and surround yourself with people that are super smart and then listen to them. And otherwise you're going to end up in the wrong place. Mate, you've just described being a professional athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a, yeah, you're right. Like, it's, not a huge it, it's so funny. It's like you said, you know, it took seven to 10 years to get there. And then I remember sort of, let's say once I kind of made it, I guess, whatever you want to call it, started doing okay in the sport. And then people say, oh, when are you going to retire? You're like, I just got here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You were one of the, the fortunate athletes to be at like the top for so long, right? I mean, incredible oh, run you had. Uh, of course, you understood how to manage yourself and train well, which staying injury-free and relatively is really a huge, huge challenge in uh, as a professional athlete, I would imagine. I never was one. But uh, that, that, yeah, I can see why you're drawing a parallel there. Um, yeah, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, and I've said it on this show numerous times. I'm incredibly grateful. But I had... Sure, I had some talent um, and I just, like you said, the passion. I was so passionate about it that I was happy to work as hard or as harder than anybody. But the final thing that I had, and you probably know the book, Malcolm Gladwell, his yeah. book, Outlier. Yeah. And he talks a tremendous amount about, uh, you know, having opportunity. And oh, my career is just splattered with incredible opportunity throughout. And that's what enabled me to have sort of that 28 years of being a professional athlete was when I got a bit, rusty or tired in one direction another door would open up yeah and my wife just calls me says i'm incredibly tinny you know and the fact that things you know fell my way you know i got tired of the olympics and the itu and then the american scene opened up and big non-drafting events happened and yeah and then they started closing and it just i had these every sort of five to seven year windows where i got a little refresh button so i i I was very, very fortunate, um, and I and I guess that's a lot the same with an entrepreneur like yourself. There's there's opportunity there, and you have to be willing and ready to see it and grab it when it's there. Um, and that's you know what I think a good entrepreneur can really do is is see what is out there, what opportunity is out there. Yeah, what and, noise? Um, what is what is noise? Which most things are. <laughs> that they come your way when you're on a path and what is a real opportunity and what is the time to actually make a change. And I agree with you. I think everybody is exposed to almost the same opportunities. It's a matter of how you prioritize and how you see opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, um, yeah. And I don't know if you're born with that or you just, you try it once and then you know the formula, but that's a big part, I think, of, of, of getting, you know, having success, whatever your success is, which I think is always has to be individual and intrinsic. I don't, think success can ever be extrinsic because then you're mm -hmm. doing it for the wrong reasons. Those two things can overlap and often do, but it, mm -hmm. it starts with the intrinsic, you know, yeah. uh, goals. No, that's a fantastic answer. I, let, let, let's have a look. Well, the next one's kind of the same thing. Um, well, let's have a, we'll run down it anyway. What, what, what is, you know, a tip that you have for people on just on, on how to optimize the lives that they're living? Yeah, I guess it's sort of a, a variant of what, you know, my answer to the previous question, but I, I think I've never looked at myself as sort of somebody that was good at optimizing in terms of, <clears throat> I guess, you know, regimented and having like from seven, eight, I'm doing this and eight to nine, I'm doing that. I, I don't think that's my skill, actually. I, I, I can be hopelessly unoptimized uh, to the point where I'm... <laughs> Well, maybe that's being optimized. So you got to be careful. Yeah. Like I always said, it's my wife, Laura. I said, I'm very good at being lazy. I'm I, be, yeah. I think I'm very stubborn and I'm willing to work hard when I feel it, that it's the right thing. But if I yeah. don't feel it, I see my son has it now and it just frustrates me to no end. But when he's, you can't get him to do anything he doesn't want to do. And, uh, and I'm driven the same way. I'm really driven by motivation. And that's why I get, yeah. if I get a scent of something and I like it, there's no stopping me. I just want to do it. Uh, but then you can't force me to do anything. And if I don't have that goal and purpose, then I'm just like in sort of a standby mode until something better comes around <laughs> from an opportunity perspective. So, so that's kind of how I work. But I, I mean, I, I think from the outside, of course, I do 
really value time in the sense that one, I'm I'm in charge of my own town at time to a certain extent, and two, I know what I want. Like with my family, you know, I have all meals with my family. I spend weekends. With, I never work on weekends. I don't log in at night unless I really have to, and I try and force myself to prioritize hard uh, during the week. So it means that I have to say no to a lot of things, and and um, but I think again it opens up for those things that you can then say yes to things that that really matter and be honest about it instead of kind of trying to be led by other people, and making you do stuff you don't want to do. You you have just answered that question so well. I'm a big advocate of kind of asking yourself who you are and and then prioritizing what do you really want. Yeah, you know, and then are you in control of your own life? Asking yourself, are you in control and a part of my life now is is that same kind of thing is exactly like you with two young kids. It's going, well, that's if I'm going to be a dad, be a dad. Yeah. And so how is that how is that going to look? All right, well, I have to get up at four each morning and work till seven. But then I and then do an hour activity of whatever work that is. And then I have the kids eight till midday every day. And then I have these hour a couple of hours in the afternoon to work again. And I do that seven days a week. But it's that designing the life that you want and pr- by the prioritizing, you know, and it's okay. If you're a dad that doesn't want to put your kids first, I get it. Get, but admit, be honest, right? <laughs> so, you, you know, yeah. and then prioritize it. Yeah, um, couldn't agree more. It's just, as long as you stay true to what is important to you and and your yeah. your close ones, and and then you can you can live with something that's different than somebody else. Maybe you decide for five years to like, I'm going to get the career going, and it's going to benefit everybody. You do that. But at least that's it's a push phase. It's a push phase. We yeah. always call it. This, we're putting the blinders on. It's a push phase. You know, and not come, forever. And go. I've been in them too. Where it's like, okay, we're selling the company this year. And we're doing this and this. It's going to be a year of, nuts. you know, going nuts. And you're like, should I do it? Yeah, the reward's big. Let's do it. And uh, yeah, but I do believe in uh, in not getting caught up in something like that where it ends up owning you, and now you have to do something. Or if you end up getting into like a big spending behavior where you're now reliant on some income that you that will entrap you and take your time then again first principles if it takes my time then it's not worth it exactly time's the number one commodity uh, as sure. i say people pay for my time not my expertise anymore it's like yeah, <laughs> it's time. Uh, it's time. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay. another question if, if you could sit and have a coffee with any living person who would it be and why might surprise you, Greg. Uh, it's another Australian, actually. Um, uh, and it's not, yeah. And and it's it's in um, it's a guy called David Sinclair, mm-hmm. uh, and he's a, I guess a geneticist or a biologist, and he I think he has a lab at Harvard, uh, and he you know he's into this whole reprogramming repro- basically, uh, where he sort of asks the question, why is um, uh, the fact that we we die at a certain age, why is that not considered a disease when we are characterizing you know, cancer and AIDS and all kinds of other diseases? We tend to sort of band it and try and cure these things instead of trying to look at the fundamental problem. And and so I, I've always been fascinated by biology and, and this whole new world of synthetic biology, I think is the next big frontier in our lifetime. Because I believe uh, AR is far down the list of of things that will make an impact, true impact in our lives. I believe that synthetic biology with, you know, the human genome project, which was finished, I think in 2003. And then you had CRISPR, the gene editing tool, which was, you know, thought of a long time ago, but wasn't really done on a human being until 2020. So you're actually able to go in and, and, and change the, the code. I believe that, that this new world is going to be not about computer code, but about human code. Uh, as in wow. ATCG, right? So the nucleotide in our DNA is code. And we have all the building blocks now. And now you're going to be programming and reprogramming and changing. Not because I'm looking, I'm not looking at the optimizing so much. I'm looking at, imagine you could now so cure all uh, inheritable diseases or cure cancer or cure all these other things. Imagine you can go from living, you know, maybe 65 years actively, you know, which a lot of people can do today if they're lucky and then they have maybe 15 years of, of, of just like slowly deteriorating. What if your lifespan could be healthy all the way through, you know, through, through, uh, through this reprogramming? And this is something that, of course, sounds like sci-fi, but it's actually now, I, I believe David Sinclair was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world last year. 
And he he read a book, uh, wrote a book called um, Lifespan, which is uh, I would recommend anybody to read. But it's such yeah, a- I, I own the book. <laughs> That's where the names. Come. I'm like, yes. So last year with a with a brand new baby, I went out and bought every time I had a guest on, they mentioned all these books, and Lifespan was one, and Breathe was another, and both. I have about a dozen books next to my bedside <laughs> with a one and a three year old. <laughs> They look good on the side table. I haven't even had a chance to to, to read it, but lifespan well, is mentioned a few times. Truly fascinating uh, stuff, and um, I think I think it's just uh, yeah. So that's that's the person I would love to have a coffee with <laughs> one day. No, it's great. What a great answer and fascinating. I'd, I'd like to just be a fly on the wall on that one if I could. <laughs> um, yeah, I might have to try and get him on the show. That's what this show is good for, right? Just reach out to people that really interest me, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's from Sydney too. So Exactly, there yeah. you go. I just say, hey, mate, I'm from Sydney too. You <laughs> ready to have a chat? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of people in Sydney. Yeah, you should probably know somebody. Yeah. Know them. Um, that's, I've been trying to get Hugh Jackman on and, and Chris Hemsworth and a few of these other Aussies on, and they, they, they're they not getting back to me yet. So, back to you, anyway. man. Okay. okay. Anybody that knows it, flick them over. <laughs> All right. I, I thought I'd finish with um, these are kind of fun, a little bit quick fire answers. So they're kind of um, some of them a little bit serious, but they're a bit, bit of fun anyway. Um, and we'll just finish up with these. So you ready? It's just 12 of them. Sure. Um, what were you doing right before this conversation? Uh, eating a chicken sandwich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Win gold in swimming at the Olympics or create the next apple of the tech world? Oh, easy. The next apple of the tech world. <laughs> uh, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 18 year old self? Um, I would say it's okay. Just do what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't worry too much about finding yourself in life. Mm-hmm. Just do what you're doing. Just, just explore. That's what got me here. Such a good answer. We're also worried in our high school, end of high school years. Like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, oh, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, last book you read? The last book I read, um, so I read a book by Ken. I'm a big Ken Follett fan, so that's sort of the, the novel and fiction. Um, mm-hmm. And um, uh, so that I can't remember the title of the last one because I've read most of the titles here, but uh, the Ken Follett book. That's all right. You can just say it. Highly, that's fine. Yeah. 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 What was his name? Ken? Ken Follett. He's a Welsh, Welsh guy. Okay. Cool. I'll check him out. Um, here's a really important question. What's the largest animal you could wrestle to the floor? <laughs> <laughs> Stuffed animals, I guess, not included. <laughs> Stuffed animals. <laughs> you know, I don't think I could wrestle uh, many animals to the floor. They seem to be just so strong. Like I have a, I know. We have a cat at home and I'm just like, I have trouble even containing my cat. So it would no. probably be somewhere in between a golden retriever and a, and a great Dane. <laughs> That's awesome. I asked Laura this the other day. I said, what would you do? She said, a wallaby. I said, oh, so you, you couldn't take a full-grown kangaroo. And I said, have you seen those little wallabies' legs? They go a million miles an hour. There's no way you're wrestling a wallaby to I mean, around. even a wombat, I would not go up there. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, here we go. More serious again. Who is the first person that comes uh, to mind when you hear the word successful entrepreneur and why? All words. Is there any word that stands out? Uh, yeah, I mean, the standard answer is I always think of Steve Jobs because I just think that his journey was so impressive. And it's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people have the same answer. But I think it's changed in recent years more to be Elon Musk. I think he's taken mm-hmm. over now. I, I would say Elon Musk. Brilliant. Two good ones. Could he um, manage himself, even though he's got some issues there? It's like he actually seems happy, and he's kind of just like he's just like doing what he's supposed to be doing. Awesome. And the amount of different things and different areas that he's been involved in. You know, if one of us had been involved in PayPal, we'd be still talking about it. Yeah. You know, we'd be we'd done and dusted. We're still talking about, it, and that's all we we going. Our legacy would have been. The guys just kept going and going Genuine and going and humble, and seems like a good guy. Like it, I, he I, does. Well, much like yourself. Oh. Um, now, favorite social media platform? Coming from somebody who does not like social media. Yeah, you mean that. At yeah, all. I should have just. I, I don't that. even yeah. go on any. I, I think I, I'm, I like Instagram because we're seeing a lot of success getting customers 
coming through. <laughs> because they were so to the point like this, you know, yeah, they go with that. Yeah, we Instagram. Yeah. All right. If you had a time machine, would you travel to the future or back to the past? Oh, man. That is, and there's no option to stay here. No, that's an option. Of course you can. Yeah, I'd stay here. I, yeah. I, I, that's actually been an, an answer where I've, I've had with other guests. Uh, yeah. Daniela Rick said that the last episode. She said, I'm quite right happy here, with right now. Now. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. I actually think that's the best answer. There you go. Um, what lesson did you learn the hard way? Um, did you have to learn the hard way? And, and how could you help others avoid that mistake? Is there anything that sticks out where you're like, ah, that was brutal? I think that the hardest lesson in life for many people, and I, myself included, is to, fly, is to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And this is, like that. Now, this is Dr. Keys commercial. I don't know if you remember that. This old guy with the beard. And he said, you know, find out what you're not good at and then don't do that. I think it's so important because everybody's focused on all this, like, I have to find the stuff that I'm good at. But it's like sometimes you just got to get away from the stuff you're not good at. And then, yes. and then you sort of get out in the open. And for me, I was always had a chip on my shoulder that my family was an engineer. I didn't see myself as an engineer. I wasn't a terribly good engineer. And I didn't feel like I was, you know, I hadn't found the stuff that I was going to, that I was going to do for the rest of my life. And, um, and, and so I, I just said, okay, I'm not going to do stuff that I'm not good at. And I started not doing that. And then lo and behold, you find what you're good at. That's it. Outsource, outsource your weaknesses. And I'm a big advocate. Anybody that's listened to me on this show would have heard me always talk about just find your strengths. And, and one of the things is with finding your strengths is, I'm a big advocate for sitting down with your partner or, or workmates and actually spend time going around the room and saying, I think you're good at, I think you're good at this. This is what I think you, I think you're a natural at this, this, this. We don't do that enough. And uh, I, I feel like we're quite good at pointing out the fact that we have, you know, where you're weak at and you could improve there and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, but outsource. Somebody else is better than that at me, so I'm going to focus on my strengths. Yeah, um, so great used, answer. I used to hand that book out, discover your strengths, uh, my old comment, recon, and, and then we would say, okay, just you know, mitigate for your weaknesses. We don't want you to you know do something crazy that can scare everybody off, but just make sure they don't impede with your you know impede your strengths. But just, just yeah, maybe mitigate is yeah, mitigate word. and then amplify <laughs> your strengths, right? So I do yeah, yeah that. I like yeah. that. Perfect. Um, next question: If you had to describe yourself as an animal, which one would it be? Oh, rhino. <laughs> For sure. oh, okay, you're going to have to give me more. Well, I've that? always been fascinated by rhinos. Um, and for me, a rhino, like I, I always I always laugh at people when they talk about unicorns. Oh, it's a unicorn. I always go, well, unicorns don't exist. You know, that's an imaginary animal. And it's kind of not that tough. Like it looks like it, it, it's not, it's, it's kind of weird. So I always go, well, I, I think rhinos are much cooler. They're... They're tough. They're tenacious. They are once they go in the direction, they keep going, and yeah. they're just big, just gentle giants. But they, so I, I'm just fascinated by rhinos. So I, maybe in the next life, I'll be a rhino somewhere, not an endangered species. So I want to be somewhere where I don't get shot at. But uh, so that's another. <laughs> that's another, another story. That's a great answer, and they're, and they're very thick skin too, aren't they? I mean, they yeah. They're tough, and they they got that horn on the front. I can, I'm just picturing you reading reading to your daughter a, a book on unicorns, and basically saying, "Yeah, you know what? They're not that tough." But that's <laughs> <this book. laughs> I'm have the heart to do that to my daughter because she loves unicorns. I'll wait till she's older and I tell her what I was thinking. But she likes rhinos too, so I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, two more questions. Number one, pet peeve. Pet peeve. Um, if you don't have any, they don't jump out. I've got yeah, they don't, that jump out. They don't jump out at me. And I think my wife will probably be able to answer that immediately. Oh, that's mm. such and such. Um, yeah. But yeah it pass. doesn't jump out. I think that's a pass. Yeah, that's all right. I think just so you know, mine, it's it's standing waiting for my bags at airport and people are having to stand right over the baggage carousel. Oh, and stand it. oh yeah. That could, that, okay, I could take that one. That, 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 that's one of them. I used to have a lot of stuff. I, I used to be, a person who would always yell at the TV. So I was used to say that my TV is covered in conflict because I'm just like yelling at it because I'm in disagreement. So I, I used to have that TV and like, why is this happening? But then I kind of got so busy with other stuff that I ended up just, I, I guess, became I a little more fluid and less concerned with things. But, um, I'm pretty sure that I have them. I'm going to go home and ask my wife. That's, that's awesome. Okay. Proudest moment of your life. Final question. Proudest, oh, when my first one. 
was born. I like love that, that. that. And of course, it happened again when my my daughter was born two years later. But yeah, that was just an out of world experience. And I think every dad and every mother would say the same thing. But it just, mm-hmm. until it hits you, you don't really understand. It's really important that it doesn't. That, I, I, Laura and I always say that that the love of a child it's so great that people that don't have kids don't know what it is, they're missing. I have no idea. No, and I don't want to be condescending about it. And that's why. I, I used to, when I was, I was single up until I was like, uh, well, in the sense that I was unmarried up until I was like 30, I think it was 37. And um, mm-hmm. so most of my friends had gone through that and been married at once, some twice and lots of kids and all that stuff. And, and they used to tell me, you don't know what it's like. And I didn't. And I, I, I truly didn't understand that until that moment when a mm-hmm. son was born. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what it's about. A complete recalibration of your values and your priorities and everything. And yet, yet I feel like I'm doing more things that I love than I ever did. So it's a weird thing. I think if you must just get more focused on things that matter. You become more productive, don't you? Yeah, you time do. matters more. Without yeah. having to do, without I, I feel that you become more productive without the self help thing of oh I have to be more productive, I have to learn this, I have to learn that. It's almost like a natural instinct that kicks in mm-hmm. that gives you that super strength of being able to not even compare to women that actually have to give birth <laughs> to kids, which, you know, we will never understand how that is like, right? But I think as a, as a man, as a father, I definitely felt that definitely sort of then suddenly I had more bandwidth, even though I had mm. less sleep and less, theoretically, less time. Yeah. I think this is a good way to, good place to end, mate, with, uh, with that. I, I can't, you know, thank you so much for your time and just, sharing your journey and just so much knowledge mate just incredible you and i i can't wait to do this again with you in the future where we maybe sit down and have a beer and just chat in person I, i'd love just, to, i'd love to do that greg and it was a real pleasure to be on the podcast this has definitely been a fantastic conversation and yeah i let's yeah. uh let's meet uh in person where i guess you're in the u.s somewhere uh, we're in boulder we're in, boulder. we're in boulder beautiful yeah beautiful place. isn't it yeah yeah yeah. Well, they're two great places, Vancouver and Boulder. We're, we were both pretty spoiled, but mate, well, I got I to gotta thank you for creating the form goggle, mate. I, 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 like I said in the introduction, I, I, I truly believe they are sort of the, the biggest thing to hit the swim world that we've ever seen. I just think it's fantastic. That means a lot. Thanks a lot, Greg. I, I appreciate that. We're going to keep, keep innovating and keep pushing this. And like I said, awareness is the most important thing for us at the moment. People seem to really love these goggles once they try them. So we just got to get them out on more faces. All right, mate. Well, let's wrap it up here. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And you can uh, see the show notes and timestamps and uh, the coupon codes and all the links at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. All right. Thanks again, Dan. Stay on the line, mate. Cheers. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.